Uh, so some, some sources say that Virgo declined the challenge of a duel, saying that it was an uncivilized way to, to, to resolve conflict. However, other sources say that Virgo responded, saying that because he was the one that was being challenged, uh, he would get to choose the weapon, right? And so he chose two identical sausages as their weapons for duel. Two identical sausages, saying that one of them was laced with a deadly gem, while the other one was perfectly fine for consumption. And so he offered the chancellor, saying to him, uh, you choose which one you will eat, and I will take the other one. When this message came back to, to Bismarck, to the, the chancellor, he decided to, to back down from this challenge, which I think was a wise choice. <laughs> now, whether or not this story is the whole truth about these gentlemen's um, political relationship, and this particular challenge, uh, the point of the story, I think, is one well, well uh, worth sharing here. And the point is, you better know the one that you're about to challenge, and you better know when to drop a challenge before it gets to be a humiliating experience for you. Now, I share this story because, as I mentioned, the last eight weeks we've been exploring a conversation between Jesus and the Jews um, that has been filled with challenges from the Jews to Jesus, uh, which have only led to an increasing disdain uh, for the man Jesus Christ by the Jews as it grew increasingly humiliating for, for them, for the, for the Jewish leaders. And so, Again, this, this part of the conversation uh, is found right at the end of John chapter 8. Uh, we'll be looking at verses 48 to 59. And this conversation finally comes to an end here at the end of this chapter, uh, which is all said to have happened right on that day after the end of the Feast of Tabernacles in, in Judea, which we, we explored at the beginning of John chapter 7. Now the, the Jews, these Jewish leaders, these Pharisees, um, they, they had a really difficult time accepting Jesus' claim his claims of, of being God, his, his claim of being the Son of God, uh, his claim of being greater than Abraham and Moses and, and so on. And now their desire to kill Jesus has only been fueled by Jesus bringing their hypocrisy to light as he respectfully challenges, challenges them about who they really are and about their religious integrity. Right? It has been very clear that the Jews really did not know the one that they were challenging. And uh, they also did not know when to quit their challenges, which is, is why we, we end up where we end up here in this, this conversation. And so as a result, just like we see happening at times in our world today, and even in the church, they resort to attacking Jesus both verbally and physically, um, to the point of eventually murdering him. I want, I want to reflect on these challenges today as, as well as Jesus' response to these challenges, and so I've titled my sermon today, Jesus Challenged, right, Jesus Challenged. So 
So John 8, verses 48 to 59, says, The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my words, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, If anyone keeps my words, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died? And the prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? In other words, who do you think you are? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I did not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the tabna of the temple. So I, I see four challenges, four ways that Jesus is being challenged. Um, in this text. I see name calling. I see falsely accusing. I see repeated questioning. And I see blatant ignoring. Right? Name calling, falsely accusing, repeated questioning, blatant ignoring. My, my wife and I, Marlene and I, have been married for almost 23 years. I know I look like I'm 23, but I'm just a little bit old. So I feel I could share with you what I'm about to share um, with the hopes that you won't judge me for something I did just about 20 years, just over 20 years ago. About two, a year or two into our marriage, um, in, the, in, the, in the thick of a heated discussion, because we don't argue, we just have heated discussions. Mm -hmm. I, I called my wife a not so nice name, a name that I'm not going to share with you because um, you, you don't need to know that. <laughs> but it, it, it wasn't a nice name at all, and it was at that very instance that our heated discussion came to an abrupt end. Uh, she didn't say a word to me for the next few days. And, you know, I came to realize how much I had hurt her by calling her uh, that name. And, and well, I, I learned a very, very valuable lesson really quick. And uh, I've never done that since. The Jews here begin in this passage that we are reflecting on by calling Jesus a Samaritan. Now if I call you a Samaritan today, um, you may receive it as no big deal. Right? If I said, hey, you're a Samaritan, you like, okay, whatever. But back then, Samaritans were considered to be the scum of the earth. At least they were considered this by the Jews. 
So much so that the Jews, whenever they would travel from, from the north, like from if they were traveling from Galilee to the south to Judea, in between which sits Samaria, uh, the, the ideal way to get from those one of those places to the other would be to go right through Samaria. But the Jews would take the more scenic route far, far around Samaria because they didn't even want to walk on the ground that the Samaritans walked on. And so the Jews saw these, these Samaritan people as unclean people because they were a mixed race people that engaged in idol worship to some extent, right? The Jews despised, they despised the Samaritans and figured that Jesus would fit right in with them because of the things that he was saying to them. So the Jews, realizing that they weren't going very far in their opposing of Jesus, looked for any opportunity that they can find to, to do away with Jesus, to, to, to kill him, to end his life. They tried their very best to really get under his skin, and it, was ju it, it just was not working out for them. So they began calling him names, right? You demon-possessed Samaritan is what they call him. And so they're, they're falsely accusing is, is the next thing we see happening. So they, they call Jesus a Samaritan name calling, then they accuse him of being possessed by the devil, demon possessed. We see Matthew highlighting a similar accusation against Jesus from the Jews. And he, he, it said in Matthew 12, 24, but when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And so they literally charged Jesus, saying that his power to cast out demons came from the devil himself. And that he was sent by the devil to deliberately deceive people and to lead people away from the true traditional religion and, and, and beliefs. The evidence that Jesus was was declaring the truth to them was, was very clear. We, you know, as we journey through the Gospel of John, we see the truth that Jesus is declaring to be, be clear, well, at least to us. However, Jesus told them in John 8 verse 45, he says, because I tell the truth, you do not believe me, right? They, they didn't believe him simply because he was telling the truth. Simply because the truth just didn't make any sense to them. These Jewish people also saw supernatural power in Jesus as he healed people. And in accusing Jesus of having a demon, I believe that they are admitting that there is some force other, outside of human capabilities, at work in healing the people and, and performing the miracles that Jesus performed, right? So the, the Jews seem to agree that there was some sort of supernatural power at play. And they refused to believe that it was God's power. And so they accuse him of being demon-possessed. The, the depth of, of unbelief that is seen here just, it amazes me. It's, it's an obstinate unbelief, a, a deeply rooted denial and, and defiance that is 
full of malice and, and attempts to injure Jesus. And we know, as we have looked at the text, that this is exactly what these Jews wanted to do. It, 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 they display an, an unbelief that is unwilling to surrender to the claims of Christ despite all the evidence. The evidence to me is clear. To some people around Jesus's around Jesus, then I'm sure it was clear to them as well. And everything Jesus was saying to them was in line with with Old Testament references to to the scripture that the Jews should have been very familiar with. Yet they did not believe. They just could not believe. They saw lives being changed when, when miracles happened, yet they refused to believe. They searched out other answers for this miraculous power of Christ. And all they could do was attribute this power to anything that would keep them from confessing Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And surrender their own lives and possessions to him. They didn't want to do that. And so they would find any excuse not to do that. And their excuse is that Jesus is demon possessed. And so this brings me to the next challenge. Which is the repeated questioning. We, we see this pattern of questioning coming from the Jews that Jesus is so patiently and graciously dealing with. All right? Questions like, who is your father? Or, are you greater than Abraham who died? Or, who do you think you are? Who are you? All, all of these questions that he has answered over and over again, they continue to ask over and over again. And so when they brought this, the, the woman caught in adultery that we read, earlier as we, we've journeyed through this gospel, um, the, the, the question that they asked him, John tells us in John 8 verse 6, says what they were really trying to do was to trap Jesus into saying anything that they could use against him. And so my suspicion is that they continue to ask the same questions over and over again so that they would find some reason, some excuse, some something against him that they can use to give themselves a good reason for ending Jesus' life. But here's the reality. When, when you're telling the truth, it doesn't change. Right? The, the truth never changes, ever. So, if, if your truth changes somewhere along the line, then it's not truth. Jesus said in the same chapter in John 8, in verses 31 and 32, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Then later on, he asked them in verse 46 of chapter 8, If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Why, why don't you believe if I'm telling the truth? The Jews were so caught up in their disdain for Jesus that they just could not believe the truth. In fact, Jesus told them that they will of their father, the devil, who has no truth in him because he's the father of lies. And so for this very reason, they just could not believe the truth simply because it was the truth. And so they resorted to this unnecessary questioning as another way to try to trap Jesus
The last way I see them challenging Jesus is by blatantly ignoring his continual invitations, inviting them to believe uh, in him and to have life. He, he constantly invites them, extends invitations to them to, to come to him, to believe in him, to hear his words. But not only the, the invitations to believe, but even all of the references to the Old Testament that he shows them as he tries to show them who he really is, they totally ignore it all. Do you know that today, Judaism that is rooted in, in Pharisee Judaism is still ignoring Jesus Christ. Judaism today is still ignoring Jesus Christ. But not, not only are these Jews still ignoring him, but even some Christians are ignoring him as well. The world is, is ignoring him and, and just like the Jews wanted to get rid of him because they had zero desire to hear what he had to say, the world today is trying to get rid of Jesus because what Jesus says or has to say does not line up with what we want, with what we desire. And so we continue to some extent to ignore him. Now there's a lot more I could say about us ignoring, ignoring Jesus, but I, I want to move on to the, the, the responses, the way Jesus responded to these challenges. I, I heard about a, a six-year-old girl that's in grade one, very, very intelligent, very bright little girl. Um, and so one day she comes home from school and her mom says to her, how was school today? She says, it was, it was all right. Um, and she says, is that that girl that has been heckling you, did she, did she bother you today? And she said, the little girl said, yes, yes she did. She, she called me fat. And the mom looks at her and, and says, well, did, did that bother you? And the little girl says, no, no, didn't bother me at all. Everybody can't be, be slim. And so the mother looks at her and, and says, well, doesn't it bother you that she's always heckling you? And this six-year-old girl looks at her mom and says, no, I'm not the one who's eight years old and still in grade one. <laughs> We, 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 we see Jesus' responses to, to these attacks of the Jews as, as cool, calm, and collected, right? He doesn't, they don't get under his skin, they, he doesn't get all riled up and, and angry like, like they have been behaving. He doesn't respond in a like manner to their attacks, right? However, he also does not shy away from the attacks either, but responds with, with grace and, and patience. There's, there's so much I can quote from just from Proverbs alone on how we should respond in such situations, but here are just a few verses um, that I've, I've selected. Proverbs 14 verse 29 says, People with understanding control their anger. A hot temper shows great foolishness. Right? Another proverb, uh, 12 verse 16, says, A fool is quick-tempered, but a wise person stays calm when insulted. Another proverb, uh, Proverbs 19 verse 11 says, If you are sensible, you will control your temper. When someone wrongs you, it is of great virtue to ignore it. 
Now I could go on and on quoting just from Proverbs, but even from Psalms and other parts of Scripture. But you, you get the idea. You, you see what Scripture, how Scripture is directed, what, what it's, it's saying about when we are attacked, when we are insulted by others. And so, in response to the, the name calling and the falsely accusing, Jesus says in verses 49 and 50, I, I don't have a demon, but I, I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet, I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it though, and he is the judge. Earlier I quoted from Matthew 12. We, we see Jesus' response in that situation when he's accused of casting out demons by a demon. He says from Matthew 12 verse 25, he says, Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. So how then will his kingdom stand? Again and again and again, Jesus tells them that he's not there for his own glory but rather to glorify his heavenly father because he wants these Jewish people to know who he really is. And they still, they still don't get it. After he says to them, I, I don't have a demon, he, he proceeds to extend to them yet another invitation to hear to understand, to believe, and to have life in his name. Even in the midst of this challenge, he continues to graciously invite them into relationship with him. And in response to the, the incessant questioning we see him saying in verse 54, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. Jesus, Jesus was not about promoting himself at all. In fact, if, if this was the case, all of his claims would be invalid. What we see Jesus saying here is that God glorifies him, not he himself. And what the Jews don't at all seem to realize is that their challenges towards Jesus are really towards the one that they claim to be their God. And so Jesus highlights the fact that that look, you know, again, like I've mentioned to you numerous times before, I'm not here to glorify myself. But again, we see that continuing to ignore Jesus as he says these things. And so in response to their blatant ignoring, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. We've, we've seen Jesus in this gospel say time and time again, I am, I am, I am, I am the living water, I am the, the bread of life, I am the light of the world. And, and we even highlighted a few weeks ago when we looked at, at John 8 verses 12 to, to, to 20, um, or, yeah, that in those, those nine verses, or no, it, from 12 to 30, 30, 
in those 19 verses that he used the words I am 11 times and he, he over and over again tries to make it clear to them this is who I am and it couldn't be any more clear than what he just said here before Abraham was I am and he says that and what do they do they gather stones to end his life because again the truth they could not believe it because they were of their father the devil and in him is no truth and so they ignored him again and again they even ignored the fact that he said to them my hour is not yet come and so Jesus realizing that he is now at a place where there seems to be no more room for talk uh, because they desire to hear no more from him he exits the temple Jesus tells us in in Matthew 11 verse 29 he says take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find you will find rest for your souls in, in all of the 89 chapters of biblical text in the four Gospels this is the only place where Jesus tells us about his own heart and he invites us all all of us to come into very close proximity to him that we may learn to be like him that we may learn to respond humbly that we may learn to be gracious and patient to the attacks the challenges that we will face as followers of Jesus Christ Jesus continually extended this invitation to the Jews and they did just like we do have the option to choose whether to believe him or not and they clearly chose not to now we know that that John wrote this gospel so that not only would every reader come to know who Jesus is but he says in John 20 verses 30 and 31 Jesus provided far more God revealing signs than are written down in this book these are written down so that you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God and in the act of believing have real and eternal life in the way he personally revealed it so my, my question to you today is, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah? Or, I, I, I see John sort of offering some options here. You, you can believe that he is the Son of God, the Messiah, or you can just think that this is a really nice story. Right? You can think that Jesus was just some lunatic claiming to be God and just brush it off as, you know, some strange dude that had nothing else to do. So, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah? I believe that our answers will be as clear as we saw it in the text today from the Jews in the way that we find ourselves challenging Jesus because whether we 
think it or not, we challenge Jesus at times too. I know I do. I just want to make one thing clear to you today though. No one challenges Jesus and wins. No one ever challenges Jesus and wins. In fact, Jesus always wins. He's, he has already won. But again, do you believe? Dear Father, we thank you so much for your word whereby we can come to know Jesus Christ, him crucified, buried, raised again and ascended into the heavenly kingdom. We thank you so much, dear God, that the Apostle John saw it fit to write this gospel Recording things that he says he saw with his own eyes, things that he heard with his own ears, experienced things that he touched and, and even so touched Jesus with his own hands. And so, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to journey through this gospel and ask their Father that as you reveal who you are to us through the man Jesus Christ, I pray, dear Father, that you would only help our unbelief, that you will help our believing in you to grow, and that you will continually draw us near to you. This is my prayer for each and every one of us, in the name of Jesus Christ.